Hello everybody and welcome. Um, I'm John Marshall. I'm the Program Director for the Master of Design and Integrated Design Program. Um, I'd like to start by thanking some people. Um, so I'd like to thank um, Hannah Smartrich. Can you wave at us, Hannah? <laughs> Hannah is the cohort lead for this, uh, for this cohort. And so I believe she will be giving some remarks at the end. So we will be the bookends. Uh, I'd also like to thank Alona Van Gent, our Associate Dean for Academic Programs. Alona is over there. <laughs> Alona has been in our position for six years and she's transitioning. Um, so our next Associate Dean for Academic Programs will be Brad Smith, who's sitting here. We <laughs> also have uh, Dean Guna Nadarjaran. Sorry, Guna. I'm, I'm Scottish. <laughs> Um, and uh, lastly, but by no means least, I'd like to thank uh, Megan Jellema, who Aww. is at the back of the room. <laughs> Megan, Megan is the dean of making us look more competent than we are. Um, and I'd just like to uh, also welcome um, C5, the next cohort of um, MDES students who are with us today, and hopefully they'll sign that paperwork, which means that they'll join us in the fall. <laughs> So the, the Master of Design is a two-year graduate program. It's a collaborative program. Um, and in that program, we work with partners, stakeholders, and constituents on social wicked problems. Um, we're about to hear from the third cohort, and their um, problem was appropriate care. And appropriate care is the right treatment at the right time with the best outcome with uh, excellent service and minimum waste. So that's the frame through which we'll be uh, hearing our projects. Um, we'll have four presentations from five students. Um, the public talk is a way, we are at a public research university, so uh, we do have a, a, an impetus to like share what we do with the public. So with the MFA program here, we have an ex exhibition. This presentation is more of an exposition. So it's a way that the students can succinctly present uh, their work to a non-specialist audience within 20 minutes. So I'm sure many of you are specialists, but the, the, we've asked them to clarify what it is that they're doing for someone who has no, no, no prior knowledge, perhaps. Um, and at this point in the program, um, this is not complete work. Um, this is still work in progress. Uh, the students still have a few weeks left when, and they have to deliver their thesis and they have to uh, have an oral defense of that thesis. So we won't see necessarily conclusions, but we should be far enough into it that they should be able to frame what it is that they've done. Um, we have uh, students from a diversity of backgrounds and you know uh, previous degrees in mechanical engineering, fashion design, graphic design, business and nursing, and public policy. So um, hopefully you'll see that they've brought that knowledge to bear as well as the, the new information and the new methods that they've learned through the program. So that being that, I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to hand it over to our first presentation. Thanks a lot. Good evening everyone, I am Prachi, I am Bruna and we welcome you to our talk today. Oh no, I just switched it off. Maybe come a little bit here. Okay. In our presentation we would like... It's mine? Well, I think if you have just one or the other, that might solve it. Okay. Oh, yeah, I switched it. Oh, switched it off. It's up. Yeah, it's off. I turned mine off. Okay. Yeah, it's off. Okay. Yeah, it's off. Okay. Hello? Yeah, it should work. No, no, no. no it's fine. Turn your mic off. I'm just talking to this. Okay. Can they hear you? Hello? 
हेलो गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन आई एम प्राची आई एम रोना वी वेलकम यू टूडे फॉर अवर टॉक इन अवर टॉक वी वुड लाइक टू टेक यू थ्रू अवर चैलेंज अवर अप्रोच एंड द इंटरवेंशन इन अवर थीसिस प्रोजेक्ट we are using design to develop a more integrated system of shared decision making tools to support patients and providers choosing post surgery pain management options managing pain after surgery is an integral part of recovery process generally it can be achieved through medicinal and non medicinal ways patients are prescribed with over the counter pain pills and also opioids to control their pain When we started researching about our project we were shocked to see the numbers The US has 5% of the world's total population yet it consumes 80% of world's prescription opioids This is a big overarching opioid crisis in the US According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in 2017 alone 47 people died every day due to overdoses related to prescription opioids and this opioid prescriptions have grown largely since last two decades again according to cdc amount of opioids prescribed per person in 2015 were three times higher than in 1999 how does this affect us apart from risk of addiction and overdoses it might not be limited to a person who is been prescribed but the over prescription might end up leaving excessive opioids out in the society and people around us might have access to it who might abuse it why is this happening we found out that patients have limited knowledge about the pain management options they have and their own individual needs so they don't feel confident while making decisions about their pain management also on the provider side there is limited understanding of patient's needs and values in summary there is a gap in patient provider communication regarding pain management so what are we doing there are multiple people and institutions who are looking into this problem and uh, trying to reduce the prescription opioids we were introduced to this problem space through improve and michigan open which is michigan opioid prescribing engagement network we specifically partnered with dr asani who is a gynecologist in michigan medicine with the goal of redu reducing prescription opioids She is testing a pilot of shared decision making tools in context of hysterectomy surgeries. The shared decision making tool allows patients and providers to have discussion around pain management and helps them to choose number of opioids for the patient. Dr. Asani's pilot is a starting point for our project. Our research suggested that there needs to be more integrated system to support the patient and provider engagement with this tool so we started thinking how might we support the interaction between patients and their healthcare providers in order to tailor pain management decisions to their individualized needs how did we approach this with our design process which comprises of research design and evaluate in our process we diverge to uh, diverge um to explore the possibilities and then converge to not narrow them down we iterate while approaching this challenge we iterated our research design and evaluated our intervention for multiple number of times the first part about design process is research where we try to understand the people most involved in the design in the process the patients and the providers So imagine yourself as a patient. You have had a health problem for a while and you're finally going to fix it through a surgery. But you're going to have to prepare a few days before the surgery and you're going to have to stay at home at least a week after it recovery. And you want to make sure you understand all the information you're giving so you can have a smooth recovery. 
you'd go through uh, six defined stages in the surgical journey. The first one is the surgical consult. At the surgical consult, you talk to a surgeon for the first time uh, about the possibility of having a surgery. A month uh, before the surgery, you go to the preoperative clinic, you talk to a physician assistant uh, about general aspects of the surgeries and the do's and don'ts before and after the surgery. Once you're at the hospital for the surgery, you'll first, first be at the preoperative hold where you talk to a variety of providers that will prepare you for the surgery. And once the surgery is done, you'll be discharged with a nurse that will give you information and expectations for once you're at home. A day later, you'll receive a call from a nurse to check if everything is okay. And a month after that, you visit your surgeon again. To better understand this surgical journey, we conducted observations, we talked with healthcare providers, and we also interviewed patients. And we had a patient workshop to understand the pain management information they got and their emotional and physical states at each point of the journey. Going back to our surgical journey, the preoperative hold is where our uh, partner, Dr. Asani, has her pilot going on. It's just before <coughs> the surgery. Based on our uh, findings from our observations and interviews, we decided to expand our project to also the preoperative clinic, preoperative hold, and the discharge. We chose those moments because they are closest to the surgery, so it makes more sense to talk about pain management with the patient. The preoperative clinics, the first stage we are focusing on, the patient will talk to a physician assistant about general aspects of the surgery. They will talk about pain management, but this conversation takes about one to two minutes maximum. And the patient will receive some information from the provider. The information looks like this. So uh, the colored part is a folder, and inside the folder you get a lot of paper. It's white, leather-sized paper with a lot of black text. The emotions that they are feeling is varied. It really depends on the patient and the surgery they're having, but we are focusing on these two. The first one is that patients feel overwhelmed by the amount of information they get, and the second one is that they are nervous. One of the reasons they might be nervous is pain. They, if they never had that surgery before, they don't really know what to expect. From our survey, we, uh, we found that the majority of patients anticipated more pain than they actually experienced. The second stage is the preoperative hold. Here the patient will talk to many providers, but we are focusing specifically with, in the interaction with the residents and the fellow. That's because they are the ones who are going to prescribe the medication for the patient. Generally, for most surgeries, there is no conversation about pain management. Uh, the patient will just be prescribed some medicine and they will find out what is that later. But for Dr. Asani, our partner, in her pilot for some hysterectomy surgeries, they do have that conversation. And it's a conversation that takes one minute or less. That conversation is supported by a tool, which is this tool. It's the shared decision-making tool. Uh, the back part in blue is the opioid talking points that the resident has to go through. It's required by law that they have to talk with the patient about expectations, side effects, and risks of opioids. And the front part is the medication they are going to be prescribed. And the bottom part of the front part it is it's when they ask the patients how many opioid pills they would like to be prescribed. There are two main things patients are feeling at this point. First, they are anxious because they're about to have a surgery. And the second one is that they are unsure. We talk to many patients and when they get the question of how many opioid pills they want, they have no idea. So most of them, they choose just to go for the maximum number of pills just in case. Finally, the last stage we're focusing is a discharge. The patient wakes up from the surgery and the nurse will be with them. They do talk about pain management. It's a conversation that takes about two minutes and that varies according to the patient. They will receive some information that looks like this, pretty similar to the other ones. And they will be feeling very tired and foggy from anesthesia and from the surgery. And all they wanna do is go home. 
But once they are home, they feel confused because they don't really remember everything they are supposed to do. And they feel a certain lack of care because all of them said they were very well treated when they were at the hospital and they were getting a lot of attention. But now they feel like they would like to feel more cared for. So based on our, all of our observations and interviews and the workshop that we mapped on that surgical journey, we had a few findings, but we decided to focus on three. The first one is that patients feel overwhelmed by the amount of general information they get about the surgery and moments when they are feeling not their best emotionally and physically. The other part is that the information about pain management is inconsistent. It's given by different providers at different times and in different ways. So when patients need to in remember important information, they don't. Finally, patient, uh, providers don't have enough time to talk with patients in depth about every topic. So uh, that makes the interaction about pain management super quick. So our goals based on those findings is first to avoid patients feeling overwhelmed because they never had a certain surgery before. You need to set expectations that they are gonna have pain ahead of time. Second, because the shared decision making tool happens at a the moment, they are super anxious and uh, they are not really understanding the information. We need to give patients time to reflect before the moment of surgery at a time where they are less anxious. And also to avoid the information to be inconsistent, we need to reiterate the same pain management information at different points in the surgical journey. And we cannot change the amount of time providers have available, but we can support patients to feel empowered to ask questions to providers and bring uh, providers and patients together to discuss and make individualized decisions for their pain management. With our research and findings, we designed a system of tools. Here is a recap of what we just saw. The information and materials patients receive regarding pain management at different points in the surgical journey. In the current system, Dr. Asani's pilot of shared decision-making tool, which happens for certain, some of the hysterectomy surgeries, happens at the pre-op hold. Now we will show you where our intervention will be. We imagine our version of shared decision making tool still happens at the pre-op hole because this is the point in the surgical journey where providers prescribe pain medication to the patient. However, our proposed system expands beyond that. We realize that patients need to understand, need to learn about different pain management options they have and reflect on their own individual needs before they make decision at the pre-op hold. So here comes learn and reflect tool, which would be introduced and handed over to patients at the pre-op clinic. Patients would go through it and reflect before the surgery while they're still at home. This would help them, this would prepare them for the next stage, which is shared decision. Shared decision tool consists of recap of learn and reflect tool. The important part here is provider understanding patient's individual need and both of them jointly making decision about appropriate pain management plan for the patient. Further, the last tool in the system is support tool, which would be introduced and handed over at the discharge by the nurse. This tool would reconfirm patient's plan pain management plan and uh, help them to act on it. This tool would support them while patient is after the discharge when patient is at home and they try to manage their pain by themselves. We started to ideate on all this each of this tool and define the attributes and work and prototype them. So here is the first here is a prototype of a first tool in the system which is learn and reflect. We did nine prototype iterations and got feedback from our faculties, providers, and patients. It's a booklet and this is how the tool looks like. The learn and reflect tool starts with setting up pain expectations for patients by saying that 
it is normal to experience some pain after the surgery we visually represented the idea of having a multimodal plan which is basically combining various medicinal and non medicinal options to treat your pain this scale guides patients about how to take medication it explains how they can add different medication how they can add medication and take opioid only when it's needed which most of the patients do not know it also asks them to go through opioid risks and side effects before choosing to take them people connect better with the stories we presented three different stories patient stories and their pain and pain management experience in our learn and reflect tool the objective of having stories is to reinstate that pain and pain management is different for each individual and hence patients need to uh, hence patients need to plan it with their provider this part of the tool prompts the reflection after discussing with our partner dr asani we came up with these three questions which would make which would help patient to think about their past pain experience their tolerance with medication side effects and how comfortable they are with alternative pain management ways these questions would or would also help providers to know the patients better while both of them jointly make decide make decision about pain management plan in the next stage which is a shared decision we did seven prototype iterations of shared decision tool this is how the tool looks like it's the it's half letter size laminated and combined together with the key ring the first part of tool uh, shared decision tool is reinstate the patient education from the previous tool which is learn and reflect providers ask the three questions to patients which the patients would already have thought upon finally with the pain management options and patients needs discussed already the main part is deciding having a discussion and deciding appropriate multimodal pain plan pain management plan for the patient here in this tool we intentionally situated opioids amongst other pain management options available further the tool also intends to emphasize on refills if patients need them The third and last tool is the support. We did four prototype iterations of this tool so far that will be handed over by nurses to patients at discharge. This is how it looks like. It's uh, a simple letter size paper printed both sides. The first part of the support tool is uh, when to take pills. So the nurses are ready have that for patients. They write down behind the materials uh, and they show of what time they should take each medication. So our tool would be just a simpler way to do it. They would just highlight the times there is information about the medication so they could uh, use that time to to explain about more about something else. The second part of the tool it's more information about how to taper and dispose of the pills. We already have some of that information on the reflect tool, but this is also an opportunity to reinforce the message when the patients need need it the most. The last part of our design process is testing and evaluation. This is one picture of one of our feedback sessions with nurses. We had feedback sessions with four providers and 15 patients so far, and we had the good opportunity to send out an uh, evaluation survey for 21 patients regarding our reflect tool. Our next steps are to have a few more feedback sessions and incorporate those insights in our final tools. To conclude our talk with our project, our goal is to integrate design and healthcare by developing tools that cater to each stakeholder's needs. We want each tool to stand individually as well as part of a system so they can equally be helpful for patients and providers to communicate and make decisions for appropriate care. Thank you. And if anyone has any question. Go ahead. 
this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great job, Bruno Mucci. Great, uh, fantastic yeah. work. Uh, I just wanted to know more about the, as two designers with two very different backgrounds, what was it like collaborating on such a complicated looking problem? Yeah, great question. <laughs> <laughs> we have been collaborating collaborating since the beginning uh, of this program since last year. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of easier for us to collaborate further this year. But I would definitely say that I personally learned a lot uh, while working with Bruna, um, getting feedback from each other, and also conflict resolution, I might say, is a like bigger thing, biggest thing that we realized and learned. Do you have anything to add? I think there are thing, things that we will learn anyways uh, by working individually or in group, like there are certain things that you learn anyways, but I think when you're collaborating, you add another complexity. Mm -hmm. uh, because we have the same, exact the same level of responsibility in this project, so I can't have exactly my way, but you can have her, her way, so we have to talk and find the middle ground. Yeah, and also we have our partner, so oh, that's yeah. another, uh, oh, another point of collaboration, yeah. We have to consider her perspective as well. Great talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I have three questions. One question is okay. <laughs> 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 I have four presentations. Oh, uh, so why did you choose paper versus other medium, such as mobile phone? Mm -hmm. And then uh, the other question is in the learn reflect stage, how often do they use these questionnaires? You know, uh, your system because. I'm not sure how long it will take to actually be able to learn and reflect mm -hmm. on what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, we, we, we can start. Okay. Um, regarding choosing the material, uh, the current shared decision making tool um, is laminated um, and um, which provider can go through it with patient. So that's uh, we think that 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 is kept bedside. So it's the best way where um, they can also clean it uh, as it's laminated, and it's very convenient to hang it near the bedside so that whosoever provider is, they can just come in and take that tool and discuss uh, about the pain management with patient. That's why we chose that medium. The other po other uh, tool, which is learn and reflect, it's more kind of a booklet. Basically, at pre-op clinic, patients get a folder <coughs> where they get all the paper, all the papers. Uh, this tool can be easily inserted um, with that can be introduced by physician's assistant and then in, uh, like inserted into the folder. Uh, so we found that's the uh, good way. You have to add something. Uh, yeah, specifically about digital tools, we consider that it would be good for certain types of disabilities. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, a paper tool, it's still the most inclusive so far, uh, especially because from the surgeries, we started observing hysterectomy, so you, we have older patients, uh, so that would be a bit more inclusive. Also, it wouldn't make sense for us to like create an app just for pain management, nobody would download that. But we have a uh, talk, there's one surgeon at the hospital, he's yeah. creating, um, uh, it's an app. And yeah. also, uh, yeah, it's digital. It's a digital platform for all the surgical journey. And we talked to him, like there might be a possibility for including at, at least the support tool on it, uh, but that would be for future. Oh, that, that was another question. Oh, there, oh there's uh, the question about the reflect. Um, yeah. What was that again about the questions, right? That they wouldn't have to. How long they use the word reflect? How they long they would use the tool if implemented? Yeah. How old they're supposed to use? Mm -hmm. like how, like how much reason can be engaged in mm -hmm. the procedure? Like, yeah. is there only one time you can do the reflect? Or that would go. Well, I. If I understand you correctly, I would answer that they would take this home, so they would be able to check it anytime they want. 
uh, it's also colored so it would stand out uh, from, the from the other materials that they get. Um, I imagine that most patients would just see that once and reflect on the questions once. But once they see the shared decision tool that has the similar um, aesthetics, they would remember what they have thought about ideally. <coughs> A wonderful example of a psychological analysis of an experience. You really nailed it about um, the kind of emotions people have going through these experiences. I wonder if you could speculate on whether your design would apply in other kinds of medical procedures or in uh, women's care in general or in any pain management or whether you feel it's more specifically tuned to this environment. Yeah, I might answer this. It's more general. Though we started up with um, observing hysterectomy surgeries, we realized that it could be expanded beyond that. Um, and um, the information we have included is not just related to women population. It can be more generalized and can be used for other procedures. Uh, rather, I would say it's most useful for the knee surgeries or the procedures where they prescribe like way more op opioid pills, like they prescribe 80 or 90 opioid pills. In that case, understanding uh, patients' needs and dis discussing and deciding on appropriate number would be uh, most useful. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Katie Jesko, and today I want to discuss with you my thesis project that has been unfolding for the last year and a half. To better aid in this understanding of this project, let's first take three important details into account to help situate us first. First, my cohort is working within the realm of appropriate care. We define appropriate care as the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. One issue within appropriate care is appropriate testing. Appropriate testing similarly means ordering the right test at the right time. This may seem as if it's a straightforward process. However, it is actually much harder than it sounds. It is a very dynamic concept. So, there are many ways in which a test can be inappropriate. One test can be the wrong test at the right time, and another can be the right test at the wrong time, and so on. Sometimes it can be hard to discern a test for a particular set of symptoms, while other times it can be easy to lose track of exactly what timing is appropriate for a particular test. And further complicating this difficulty is that 90% of tests are ordered by first year residents. This is not only huge, but a critical part in the process to understand. Second, who actually performs these tests and provides the results to the residents? The answer is pathology. Now, if you've ever found yourself having a health issue of some sort, your doctor is likely to order tests to either diagnose or monitor your illness. Various samples of bodily fluids are taken, such as blood, urine, or tissue samples. These samples are then sent off to a mysterious place within the hospital to be fulfilled. That mysterious place is pathology. You could kind of think of it as the back office, but an essential key part of the entire hospital system. And third, my group of partners come from a department within pathology at Michigan Medicine, the Department of Quality and Health Improvement, or DQHI. To give us a bit more background, some internal goals for pathology as well as DQHI are in regard to aligning on more efficient operations so systems are not burdened by having to process a large number of unnecessary tests. DQHI also consists of an extensive group of people with various backgrounds and specialties. Some of these include pathologists that have specific knowledge, but overall they are all motivated as with many providers, by the goal of better patient care. 
So, over the last year and a half, I've been working with DQHI in the context of more appropriate testing via a dashboard to try and reveal patterns of inappropriate or unnecessary testing while also aligning to the objective of patient-centered care. For the first half of 2018, I lived in the space of non-ICU and ICU settings in various units. And for the last year, I've been focusing in the space of non-ICU general medicine. But let's take one step back first. You have more than likely interacted with dashboards at various points in your life. A dashboard can be described as a device that allows you to understand patterns or metrics of behavior or actions through various data visualizations. Here are two examples of dashboards you may be familiar with. Or here's another example of a current existing healthcare dashboard, as you see here. So again, DQHI wanted to design a dashboard to help reach their goal of more appropriate testing. And again, DQHI's de approach as a department is around keeping testing in the realm of giving results that would be diagnostically valuable as opposed to cre potentially creating false positives. This could include issues around efficiencies and operations or be from a cost perspective as well. And in working with DQHI, I realized that their approach to the dashboard is, it, is for it to be utilized by administrators, such as service chiefs, to monitor the test ordering of their units. But like many problems that exist, we must come at them from different angles. DQHI's dashboard is approaching the problem from one angle, but I actually saw a different angle that we could approach this problem from instead. As a visual UI and UX designer, this was very much in the realm of my previous experience and interests. And as I began to understand more about the dashboard that DQHI was creating, I started first by taking a step back to truly understand their standpoint during the ordering process of how they were approaching the dashboard. And in doing so, I noticed that their dashboard was primarily targeted on the diagnostic outcomes of tests, which were already ordered from around a financial or operational standpoint. So then I asked, what if my dashboard could then, what if the dashboard could instead focus on the decision-making process of ordering tests to better support residents in making more informed decisions? Now, I specifically took this approach because, again, 90% of tests are ordered by first-year residents. But also because I believe that certain information can help make people more aware of their behavior and support them in their decisions. I essentially had a hunch that this could be another or even better way to approach the dashboard to be able to reach the goal of more appropriate testing. And so as any good designer, I started my process off by utilizing a co-design framework which is an approach that actively involves all stakeholders and users in the design process to ensure that the result is not only usable, but that their needs, that, that they also meets their needs as well. And I also want to quickly highlight some of the methods that I utilized during the last year and a half that I will be expanding on today. So I first started with observations to better try and understand the ordering process from their perspective of the residents. Therefore, I spent time examining different points in time of rounds, such as before, during, and after. And while I found many interesting details, what was most fascinating was how they generally perceived the ordering process. So during these observations, I was able to see where or even how tests were physically ordered but I noticed that I couldn't actually see the internal decision-making process of a resident ordering a test. So I spoke with various residents, pathologists, and other expert specialists to try and see and even understand what happens during the decision-making during decision-making in regard to the ordering process of residents. And in doing so, I was actually able to create a journey map method of what the ordering process for residents really is. 
This was done in tandem with residents through observations, interviews, and conversations. And when I did this, I just saw, I got to see just how many things residents have to do on a daily basis, which is a lot. So it is also important to note too, that a test can be actually ordered during any of these, any of these points within the process. This can also be a motivational factor for having the inclusion of various data to be included within the dashboard. And what I also found was that the resident ordering process can be simplified into three journey phases, building their case, making their case, and employing their case. These phases were again created and verified with the amazing residents that I had the opportunity to work with. It is from them that I received positive feedback and that these were in fact accurate and subjective phases which weren't actually being defined by anyone within the Michigan Medicine Healthcare System. In, in finding out these three phases, I noticed that these multiple facets that go into the decision-making process were mostly about diagnosing and treating the medical issue at hand. So now I understood the test ordering process of residents and how their decision-making process was largely invisible and that residents seem to think of the test ordering process in a perspective around building a medical case instead of focusing around the treatment and medical issue at hand. I'm sorry, focusing mostly around treatment and medical issue at hand. So now I wanted to know what residents consider when they are ordering a test. I wanted to know what their concerns are or aren't. So I did over 13 rounds of a card sorting method. Which is, which is a method that gets at user desirable information with all various years of residence. And what I essentially found here was further validation. Most residents say they consider these factors, which tend to fall around the premise of solving the medical issue at hand and how are they, and how they are perceived in doing so. Most said that, oh, sorry. Most said that they sort of consider other preferences in regard to patient care. And lastly, most said that they don't really consider cost or unintentional negative outcomes. So now I was able to find out exactly what they are aware of and care about, but also what they aren't aware of or what they don't care about. So this led me to ask myself, how could I visualize the unconscious process of what's happening inside the heads of residents when making trade-offs in the decisions of tests that they are ordering. So I made some prototypes to better understand how residents make these trade-offs around various information that they consider or don't consider when ordering a test. So I presented two prototypes to residents. I first told them to imagine that they are about to order a test for a condition for a patient and they pull out their mobile phones and open a new app resource. They then enter the test that they are considering to order. I then gave them this first prototype. This prototype contained information around how long a test would take to be filled if it needed to be sent out, the percentage amount of times the test was inappropriately ordered within their unit, how much the test might cost, and how many times their patient was tested via a needle poke in the last certain amount of hours. And this is what I heard from residents. A second year resident said, as a resident, my job doesn't depend on my patient being satisfied. However, I'm not actively trying to hurt anyone. And <laughs> in regard to a three day send out test, I heard this from a third year resident. If I knew it would take X consecutive days for a test to come back, I might not order that test, especially if my patient was nearing discharge. So then I showed them this second prototype with the same scenario. However, this information would come up instead. It included best practices on when to order a test, if a test needs to be sent out in a description for how long it would take for the test to return, the last time a patient was awoken for a test, and to calculate a patient's DRG, which is essentially how patients are billed. And this is what I heard from residents regarding this information. 
From a second year resident, I heard, I'm not going to click on the best practices personally because I would have already talked to my attending on why I'm ordering this test. And in regard to the time of a patient being awoken, I heard this from my first year resident. This is a good dose of reality. If I knew my patient was awoken for a test, it might change my decision. So, while I found out that many facets through this entire process and these prototypes, I'm going to highlight one major key finding that I discovered. So I was able to validate that patient care seems to be getting lost within trying to solve the medical issue of a patient. This information that was used in these prototypes, such as how long a patient's been tested in a certain number of hours or the cost of a test, felt relevant to residents, but they weren't conscious of this information on their own. Only once this information was shown to them did it sometimes become a factor that they would perhaps take into account to some varying degree. In summarization, most residents may be potentially more narrowly focusing on the medical issue in question and in return lose track of a more holistic sense of patient care. Again, when residents were prompted with information presented in each prototype to the topic of holistic patient care, they almost instantaneously recognized the validity of concerns around patient well-being and cost. But patient care is not considered as high as it should be. It needs to be taken into account along with the medical issue at hand, and in doing so can lead to more appropriate care in more appropriate testing. I then re revisited the decision-making process to ensure that all facets are being considered appropriately. And when I went back to the decision-making process after going through all of these methods, I essentially realized that even though the ordering process is commonly regarded as a three-stage process, it is actually a four-stage process. When we think of the decision-making process, which is stage two, we sort of speed through the true understanding of how these decisions are made. We are not fully aware or conscious of what is really happening here. The decision-making process is unstated, unmonitored, unconscious, and is not at all visualized. It's sort of like a black box. We don't know what's in it or how to approach it. We have this action that happens in the middle of this process that we tend to think of as a non-stage, but it actually is a stage. However, if we were to ask ourselves or others what truly happens here, we probably wouldn't be able to even understand or communicate what actually does happen here. This is all internal, tacit, and an invisible knowledge. Information influences and experiences to reach these decisions. And what my approach to the dashboard can do is to help visualize this stage, to help others realize that this stage exists. And not only that, but to turn the stage of an unknown black box into a glass box so that we can see and understand what happens within this stage so that residents, specialists, and administrators can understand all the internal and external influences that play into the decisions that residents make. So that this stage of the decision-making process and all the influences that go into those decisions can be understood and recognized. Once they are understood and recognized, the dashboard can offer various information from the standpoint of medical issues, specialist information, and also patient-centered appropriate care so that it can support residents in making more informed decisions when ordering tests and impact appropriate testing as a trickle-down effect. By having a dashboard created in tandem with residents to be utilized by residents within the decision-making process of ordering a test, it can support them in their decisions. By showing them information that they are aware of and favor, it allows the dashboard to become desirable and adoptable but also by including information that they are not aware of or don't necessarily consider when ordering a test, it, the dashboard can then support them to help them not only make more informed decisions when ordering tests, but to essentially align with Michigan Medicine in appropriate testing by keeping patient-centered appropriate care in mind. 
This can create a true possibility of changing the behavior of residents in the future and lead to the goal of appropriate testing. This approach to the, to the dashboard would help to mediate gaps of knowledge, information, and resources between expert specialists, including pathologists and residents. There is a true value in making the internal tacit process external and explicit so that everyone can become more aware and conscious, making the invisible visible. So what's next? In the future, it would be great for, to build other parts of this dashboard for other units and services, for other roles to utilize, not just residents. The implications of this context is that it can be applied beyond pathology and even beyond Michigan medicine. At the end of the day, we have to ask ourselves, does this have the ability to shift what people are thinking about, make them more conscious of a process, and support them in trying to know how to change their behavior? Thank you. Yeah, so um, in terms of when I mostly viewed residents, uh, most residents do work mostly during the day or they have morning rounds. Um, and then during the night, mostly the patients are almost supervised or monitored by nurses and other providers. Um, so within these talking to residents, most of these rounds happened again early in the morning, starting about seven or 8 a.m. and would continue until about noon. Um, within that, I didn't specifically hear anything regarding like information to be given at different times would be most helpful. Um, however, in terms of what information was available and, and again could sponsor or show what happened at different times, such as if a patient last got tested say at 3.30 in the morning, um, it would start to, I did get some feedback that it would start to um, either take into consideration or they would be a little bit more careful in how they're ordering a test or if they're going to put a test in during that time. Um, but, you know, it's kind of a different situation for, for each individual too. So I don't know if I have the exact answer for that at the moment um, or exactly what that could be. However, I can say that to imagine it um, is that one of the outcomes I want to do when wrapping up my presentation, I'm sorry, my project over the next month is that in giving kind of a handoff to my partners in BQHI, um, I want to give them kind of a like a blueprint almost like a plan of stating like how I did this work what my findings are but not only that um, in these examples but also the methods I use so that this could be um, that so they could further this within their unit of pathology and BQHI and working with certain units and services but then also that it can be a sort of handoff um, to where other people in other units and other services can take this and start to expand on it and understand my process and my methods 
and these different kind of varying factors to consider or how to approach, um, I guess, this, this complex space of these problems so that they have, sort, they have sort of something to go by and follow upon. Um, and then, of course, my thesis would just go more in depth within this process, too. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, my name is Haryong, and I'm pleased to have uh, today's opportunity to share my research project with you. The title of my research project is Designing Self-Repression Tool for Patients Who Are Living with Type 2 Diabetes. I will start with, uh, I will first talk about background of my research project. And then I will give you an example of uh, uh, patients with diabetes, how they live their life every day. And then I will tell you why I chose the topic of reflection. And then I will introduce my research questions and the uh, uh, design research process that I conducted to explore this question. And lastly, I will introduce the design intervention I created. I created two kinds of design intervention. One is self-repression tool, and the other is reflection sharing tool. I'd like to start with some statistics. 9.5% of US population have diabetes. Among those who are 65 years old, about one-fourth of them have diabetes. Additionally, about 26% of US population have prediabetes. Prediabetes is a condition that can lead to diabetes if not well treated. Another statistic, however, shows that 45% of people with diabetes, about half of them, do not achieve optimal level of A1C level. A1C is the blood test that shows uh, average gluco uh, blood glucose level over the two to uh, three months. As you can imagine, as you can see, uh, diabetes is a chronic illness, but many people struggle to manage it. Now, I'd like to uh, let's imagine we are here, we have a patient with diabetes here, and let's follow his everyday life. Uh, this is about his diet. It's lunch time, but he can't have a lunch at his regular time because He's so busy at his work. Eating constantly is very important for patients with diabetes because it helps them to maintain their glycemic control. Here, you see the red dot on the screen, and this represents the pain point, difficult moment that patients experience every day. And in the late afternoon, he feels hungry, and he wants to have some snack, but he realized that he forgot to bring his snack. So he goes to vending machine, but there is nothing healthy he can buy from the vending machine. So he comes back to his desk, and he sees his colleague have a cake celebrating team performance. He feels left out. How about his exercise? It's raining today, so he can't take a walk. At the end of the day, he's too tired to exercise. How about his medication? In the evening, he goes to the restaurant with his family, and he orders a dish, but he doesn't know when, so when food is served, because he needs to take a medication 30 minutes before the meal. Here, he has another pain, uh, he experiences another pain point. At the end of the day, he checked his blood glucose number, and he found that his number is quite high. He doesn't understand why, because he did his best throughout the day. He became angry. Uh, imagine person with diabetes experienced these difficulties and pain point a few times a day, and every day. And imagine it continue a week and month. And imagine it continue 10 years and 20 years. 
As a way of helping people with type 2 diabetes, I focus on self-reflection for my project. You might wonder, why? Why reflection? Uh, according to study, reflection helps people to transform their emotion and experiences into words. And this cognitive process can be beneficial to people in various situations. Uh, studies have been conducted with patients with uh, chronic pain and patients with cancer. Uh, my project partner, a uh, physician of family medicine, uh, she commented that there was a connection between emotional, uh, emotion and metabolic conditions. So it's not separated. So reflection is important part of self, uh, diabetes self-management. Another aspect to consider is that we are all different. This is particularly true for patients with diabetes, diabetes because they all have different life conditions, different uh, lifestyle, and different body mechanism. This is a comment from one of the patients I interviewed. I asked her, if you meet someone who has been just diagnosed, what would you like to say to this person? She said, rather than comparing yourself to others, compared with others, and rather than mimicking others' success, find your, way, your own way of dealing with and manage diabetes, diabetes, and then you will have more success. Uh, one of the nurse educators I interviewed also said that even if we are experts in diabetes, patients themselves are experts on their lives. So the comment from the health professionals and patients shows that it's very important for patients to find their own way of managing diabetes and learn from their experience. So this is my research question. How might we design self-reflection tool that can we can support people with diabetes to engage their uh, to increase their motivation and engage in their diabetes more actively? Uh, this is the uh, design process I conducted. In the initial stage of the design process, I interviewed 13 experts expert in the field of design, diabetes management, and psychology and education. I also had a one-on-one -on -one interview with patients in order to better understand their life and their struggles and their hope. I also attend the diabetes educational class and support group. Design process is non-linear and iterative. So after de uh, developing initial prototype, I test and then I incorporate feedback from the patient, making changes iterative cycle. Uh, this is uh, one of the photo of uh, one of the photo of how I synthesize all the information gathered from patients and health professionals. Uh, in this stage, uh, two, com uh, two things became clear. One thing is reflection is important. Second, however, reflection is hard to do. I ask a patient, why do you find it hard to reflect? One of the patients said that, I'm too tired. I don't want any more work. The other patient said, I'm too busy. I don't have time to reflect. So they find it hard to reflect. In this context, how can design help? So I ask a patient how I can better design self-reflection tool for them. And they say, Diabetes care alone is enough, uh, alone itself hard enough, overwhelming enough. So don't make it look serious. It has to be fun. Another patient comment that made interesting comment. I want to be inspired rather than motivated. So in my project, I see my role designer as my role as an initiator. This means that I design and introduce self-reflection tool for patients so that they can enjoy, feel engaged while using it. So by now, uh, 
Now I think I can introduce self-reflection tool I uh, designed. And then I will be presenting uh, what I heard from the patient and what comment they made to this tool. This is the packet of self-reflection tool. I name it Health, Happiness, and Me. There are three components in this, tool, in this packet. First component is self-reflection journal called PAUSE. This means that a patient can pause at any time and they can reflect on anything that has happened. When patients open, open this journal, they can see this. On the left-hand side, they can reflect on their diabetes measurement, such as food and exercise, medication, and glucose, number moni uh, glucose monitoring. They can think about it and they can write about it. On the, left, uh, on the right hand side, I ask the patient to think about something they want to keep in mind, something they feel grateful for the day or particular success they made during the day. Here, they can freely, freely express their thoughts, feelings, and emotions. Building on this first component, second component is a reminder. I provide the patient uh, with different types of materials, such as stick note and paper tag, which has the encouraging words like cheers and for you. With this tool, patients can create their own reminder, and they can put it somewhere they can easily see it. Third component is an uh, information card. Uh, I created this to provide information about how self-reflection can help with diabetes. And it describes the effect of self-reflection on diabetes management and how expressing feelings and emotion can have a good impact on their health. So this is the current version I developed. And you are welcome to have a look after this talk. It's there. And now I believe all of you are very keen to know about the uh, findings I developed so far. Uh, uh, in order to find how patients feel about this and getting feedback from the patient, I use the one-on-one -on -one interview as a design research method. I recruit a uh, patient from, uh, with the help of office of patient experience. And I had one, uh, three one-on-one -on -one interview with five patients. So in the first interview, I introduced self-reflection tool, and I asked them use for two weeks. And in the second interview, I asked them how they use it, and what was helpful, and what wasn't helpful, and what improvement can be made. And then I provide revised uh, self-reflection journal, and then ask them to use another two weeks. And, in the, and I had one more, the last interview. So patients who participate in this research, they use this tool for about months. So what I have found so far. First, for most of patients I interview appreciate the time and just sit and think about their life. One of patients made this comment Rather than just go, go, and do, do, it was really good to just think about what was good and what wasn't good. Interestingly, he made this comment. He thought that he will not have time to reflect, but in fact, he did. Second, pause can increase awareness and problem-solving skills in diabetes management. Uh, one patient said that one day when he reflected, he realized that he forgot to take morning math. He said usually he doesn't, uh, he doesn't forget to take evening math because he takes other medications in the evening as well. So he thought about why, and he came up with this idea. Why not putting math, the morning math, on the stove in the kitchen? So when he gets up, he goes to the kitchen, and he will see the mat immediately, and he will take it. 
Another patient shared this story. Uh, uh, when she reflected one day, she realized that she didn't take any exercise. So what she did was she stand up and steps up and down five times before going to bed. Another patient shared this story. Uh, uh, this tool helped uh, uh, help him to be more conscious about the volume of food he eats. One day, he had a spoon of ice cream instead of bone, so he was grateful that he made a good choice. All these changes are not dramatic, small changes. But what's important is that patients reflect and realize and take connection. Third, pause can, ha pause can have different meaning for different patients. Uh, one patient said that uh, as time passed, uh, her stories, whether success or failure, will be accumulated in this journal. So this tool can be her own memory book. It was interesting for me to see how patients assign different meaning for, uh, to these tools. Another patient said that she sees her doctor every six months. So next time she visits her doctor, she wants to bring this tool with her and then start a conversation. For instance, on this day, I had a pasta and I felt bad. So to her, this tool is not only for herself, but also for her, for her doctor to understand her better. Through the one-on-one -on -one interview with the patient, uh, one of the things I learned is that it is us designer who create the design things but it is actually people, users, patients, who decide how to use it and how to find the meaning. Fourth, uh, page, uh, pause can facilitate new thought about what's important and what's meaningful. Uh, with one-on-one -on -one interview with the patient, I had the privilege to listen to personal, their personal stories and learning. With the permission from the patient, I'd like to share some of them. She works full time and she's got three kids. Uh, one day, she was watching her kids just playing, and this made her feel grateful. During the interview, she said, What a simple life. There isn't one great thing, there are many small things. Another patient said that one day she attended a bullying fundraising event for the youth. And when she reflected, she wrote on the journal, I'm grateful that I was able to give back. These patients are uh, some of patient story I hear I heard from the interview were so powerful and inspiring. So this experience as a researcher led me to another research question. How can these stories and reflection can be shared among other patients so patients can learn from each other? For the remaining minute, I'd like to, I'd like to share how I examine these questions. This time, I name it Pause Together. First, I, rede I redesign self-reflection journal. At the top of the journal, I put some quote from the patient. So each page have different quote from the patient, so patient can read different messages on each day. For instance, one day, patient may read, I need to become my own best friend. Another day, patient may read, I can change one thing at a time. Another day, patient may read, diabetes is just a word, not sentence. I can add more to it. Another idea was to create reflection sharing tool. The glass ball you see on the slide contains uh, envelopes with different, different colors and each envelope has a different reflective message I hold from the patient. So this ball can be put in the place where patient can easily see doctor's office, for instance. So they can take one of the envelopes 
and read it, this last open it and read this lessons. I place this self reflect uh, reflection sharing tool as well as self reflection tool in a place where my project partner Caroline Richardson is running a project. Uh, there is one uh, dietitian who sees the patient every day. So I put the, I put them uh, just two days ago. And I put this uh, reflection sharing tool on the table at, uh, next to patient chair. So in conclusion, diabetes management is challenging and complex. Self-reflection tool can help patients pause so they can learn and experience, uh, they can learn from their experience and also patients can pause together. Uh, one patient's reflection can help other people to learn uh, based on their experience. Uh, in this project, I see my role as an initiator. This means that I design and introduce tool for the patient. So patient, uh, this can help patient to, uh, this can motivate the patient to try reflection and they can enjoy and they can use it in the long term. So that's all for today and thanks for your time and attention. I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you, it was a great talk, I really enjoyed it. Um, I have two questions. Yes. One is about, um, you mentioned that it should be inspiring and somehow did that help. Mm. So I was wondering to what extent the form and the appearance matter, mm. or is it about the content and the prompts provided within the tool? Mm -mm. What do you think? I mean, for the inspiring, I think uh, if we go to internet, you can see many inspiring messages. So what's the difference in this case? I think this message is from someone who has a similar and same struggle that we do. Someone who has same concern with them. So this kind of shared experience, shared concern, that make uh, this message is more inspiring. Okay, let me reframe, let me reframe the question. Okay. Would you make the tool now more colorful or cheerful? Because uh, you mentioned that patients don't want to have it, mm. they want to like think it's too serious. Yeah. That's my question. How do you make it more like non serious? Mm. So, this is the current version of journals and self reflection tool, and I took uh, several iterations. So, for instance, like the color combination in the beginning stage was not yellow and green, it was yellow and red, and I tried different colors. And also, in terms of text and in terms of icons and things, uh, I make a small changes in an iterative cycle, and then like uh, so rather than make uh, so uh, making tools more more uh, making tools more inspiring uh, inspirational to me that means uh, how patient can use it more effectively so for instance in the initial stage there is no space for like uh, plenty things for tomorrow and then they say I didn't realize that patient to dive with patient they tend to plan things ahead so I incorporate this idea and make some space. So for me, making more inspiring doesn't mean they're making, making it more colorful. It means that making this tool more useful and then they feel engaged and they feel, oh, this is for me. Because uh, many things they, uh, there are many things that diabetes patients have to do. So what I want to try to do is give them feeling of I want to do rather than what I have to do. So the, the one of the way I can give this feeling is that once I understand and emphasize their needs and they incorporate their idea into this tool. So that's my way of understanding patient and making more inspirational rather than making more colorful. Okay, okay. my second quick question is about incorporating the needs and the context of use. Yes. So, so um, in many occasions, like having diabetes, mm -hmm. um, you know, comes with having other conditions, mm. like hypertension, for example, mm. where you can have depression. Mm -hmm. So in your research, do you find correlation
conditions or how people, you know, like deal with multiple conditions? I mean, diabetes is a complex disease and there are many things that should be considered like even like educational level and family history and there are many things to consider. So I uh, interview like five patients each uh, three times. So what I find different is that not in terms of condition they have, but what I find is that there are differences in terms of personality and characteristic. Some people naturally they feel grateful for something and some people by, by nature, they like uh, reflection, and some people prefer talking and rather than writing. So rather than in the difference of condition, I would say there is a difference between in terms of patient personality and character. There can be a difference in terms of effect, uh, effect of this tool. Thank you. Any other? Yeah, I have a question. Tell us a little more about what you think the benefit is to the patient about the pausing. Hmm. Uh, there is a, a gap between motivation and taking action. So when they get some uh, education, you can get motivated. But not many people who are motivated take an action. In my idea and in my research, I found that this pausing and reflection can help them to realize something. So pausing can be beneficial, can benefit people to, to, to reflect and they can learn. Because when, I, when things are in, uh, in, in the head, it's hard to, it's not really concrete. What I heard from the patient is that when they pause and when they like something down, things become concrete. Things become concrete, and so I think there was a value of being pausing. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Katherine Jones, and I'm excited to share with you my thesis, which is titled A Case for Youth of Foreign Policy. How design can bridge communication between youth and policymakers in the creation of adolescent health policy here in Washtenaw County. So for the past 10 years, I've been working professionally in the realm of community organizing and advocacy. With a passion for civic engagement, I'm always looking for opportunities in which citizens can be a part of the policy process. When you think about this title, you might not immediately think appropriate care. Um, but what I hope to share with you tonight that appropriate care, yes, it means communication with your doctor directly, but it also means communication with those who are in positions of power to dictate how our system is structured. By sharing our lived experience, we're able to have, a, we're able for our system to respond in appropriate ways to our needs. So when we think about civic engagement, you might be familiar with attending a town hall, testifying at a hearing, or doing a letter campaign. And from my experience, what I find, and this is especially for youth, there's so many barriers which relate to access, knowledge, and influence. For instance, youth might have, not have transportation to get to a town hall. They might have the, not have the knowledge to know what to say after hearing when testifying. It's also a very intimidating experience, having it done it myself. And also letter campaigns. I'm sure some of you have been in this room where you've sent a letter off to your policymaker, the political void, you have no idea what's gonna happen, did anything happen? So we need newer ways in which youth and citizens abroad really can engage with policy. Oftentimes, it's, it's not that policymakers don't want youth voice, they just don't know how to get it. Youth are considered vulnerable. Uh, things I heard in my research is that they're inaccessible. We need more ways in which youth can be part of the process. And youth who do engage, because there are plenty of politically engaged youth, it's often from a position of privileges. privilege. Not all of us have the time, money, and ability to get to talk to our legislators. So my thesis partner, Dr. Tammy Chang, created this tool called My Voice, which essentially was her way, as well as fellow researchers at the university, to get at some of these barriers that I'm talking about. Essentially, My Voice is a text message-based survey tool where youth are sent out four to five questions each week about particular health topic areas. Through this, we're able to gather their experiences, 
which we hope to summarize and share with policymakers who are interested. So how does my voice work exactly? Essentially, it starts with seeking input. So Dr. Chang and her team either reach out to my voicers, as we call them, the youth who participate in the process, and we ask them what their top priorities are. Or we reach out to research partners and we ask them what they're interested in. Through there, we draft our four to five survey questions, which is sent directly to our youth via text message. They do it in the privacy of wherever they are in real time. We get that information back. And then we synthesize all of these text messages to figure out what are the underlying themes that are happening here and how can we share this information with policymakers. And speaking with Tammy, she mentioned that her greatest barrier right now is that sending to policymakers, and based on my professional experience and my new design skills, might be a great way to intervene and think about different ways to do this. So what does she do currently? This is basically it. It's a giant report that has all these different themes, and they just dump in all these different text messages. And feedback that they receive from policymakers is this is interesting, but I don't know what to do with this. I don't know where, how it can inform my decisions. I'm not sure where it fits in my workflow. Additionally, um, my voice has done annual reports, or the My Voice team has done annual reports, and they have some quantitative data about the overall themes as well as some of the different youth voices put in. So, in thinking about my project, we identified three re research questions to approach. The first is at what point in the policy process can this information be delivered? Who are the key stakeholders who would want or be able to use this information? And how should, how should we design the information so that it can aid in decision making? So to get started, I jumped into the first question. I scoped here to Washtenaw County, which is a local county. And I began reaching out to policymakers to figure out how does the county process work? How does adolescent health policy occur? And what I found very quickly from my sketch that you can see is it's complicated, it's confusing, and it's intimidating. There are so many points at which citizens have opportunities to engage, but again, you know about the previous barriers that I've talked to, but also policymakers themselves don't really know when is the best moment in time. They are sort of, they know that the problems exist, but they don't know when the information should, should arrive. So that led me to the decision to think about, can I create a strategic policy framework, not only to help my own understanding of this messy process, but also the My Voice team to be able to understand when in the process they can use it, but what information is relevant at that time. So from this, I went to this, a lot easier to understand, four-stage policy process, which starts with formulation. So in this process, policies are being, uh, policy issue areas are being considered, public discourse is happening, raising awareness about particular issues. The My Voice tool can really aid in understanding what are youth's top priorities. Again, I don't think I mentioned it, but the youth are aged 14 to 24, so there's a little bit of a range from teenagers to sort of young adults. So again, what issues are, are they interested in? What do they want to, uh, to hear or have policymakers consider? The next is just essentially moving from adoption, so uh, from formulation to adoption. So an issue is identified, they know they're gonna pass some type of policy, whether it's a mandate to address this issue, money to address a particular issue. And really what My Voice can, the My Voice team can do is give legitimacy to policymakers. So they can stand up and say, I voted for X policy because I heard from youth via the My Voice tool that these are issues that they wanted to have. The next is implementation. So this is where we as a public really feel our government working. These are where the programs are designed and sort of implemented into the world. Um, they often do do community assessments, but again, who is part of that assessment? How diverse is that population? Is it relevant to their needs? So My Voice can really, the team can really reach out and find out what, you, what, you, what issue areas do youth have, but like how is it affecting their lives? What are their current barriers? What co programs are available and what do they want to see? And last is evaluation. In an ideal world, all policies are evaluated. This doesn't happen, as we know. But in my framework, I'm idealistic, we're gonna make it happen. So essentially, that program has been implemented and uh, public agency staff or whoever's in charge of it does need to report back to policymakers, hey, this is whether it worked or didn't work. And so my voice can help with performance metrics. How are youth evaluating programs? What do they think is working or not working? What do they still want to see? So with any cyclical process, evaluation would go back into uh, formulation, what other problems are involved, do we need to do another thing? So now that I kind of had a general idea of, okay, this is a policy process, um, this is how my voice relates to a policy process, who should we be talking to? So again, I'm working in Washtenaw County, so I reached out to 
22 individuals uh, within the realms of community development, um, health policy, youth development, a broad stroke, um, really to understand what's happening around youth policy currently in, in the community. Who would be interested in this information? And what I learned um, is that the community, the community Mental Health Board, which is a county agency, as well as the county health department, are really digging into youth issues right now. Um, I learned about a rising mental health crisis that's happening in the county. And they're really kind of trying to scramble and figure out what are you thinking about this issue? How can we serve our community? For context, as of 2018, suicide is the second losing cause of death for those aged 15 to 34 in Michigan. So it's a real critical issue. This is uh, substantiated with national data that shows that seven out of 10 youth say depression and anxiety is a top priority of their peers. And as well as our My Voice search, when we sent out a top priorities data, mental health care was at the top. So this is a clearly a critical issue for the county. It's a clearly a critical issue for youth. So I developed my case study and I decided to focus on the implementation stage. So what programs can we create? Currently in the county, they've passed a mandate. So they've moved through that adoption phase and they decided to allocate money to this issue. So they're in the process of designing programs. So how could my voice work together and help them figure out what's going on? So I had my key stakeholders, I had my problem, I had my process, and I was ready to think about how do I actually design this information so that it could aid in decision making. And I wanna pause here to just say, clarify, we are not designing conceptual models of care. We are not taking this data to determine how to administer care. That's not the position we're in. We are designing tools to aid in decision making. It's essentially visualizing the data in a way that can be usable and actionable. So what do policymakers currently get? Uh, those familiar might know them as white papers or one pagers. Essentially, they're heavy quantitative data giving the scope of a particular issue could range from a variety of issues. Um, I also threw in my voice um, what they do currently as a reminder. But basically what we find is it's too text heavy. It's not, it's not easy to digest. It takes a long time. It doesn't fit in their workflow. It's missing storytelling and narrative. So we know any advocate that works in this space knows that personal stories is what moves the needle. But it's not actionable. So it's a lot of information, but policymakers don't know what to do with it. It's not either relevant to their current constituents, um, it's not an issue that they need to worry about, or they don't know how to make decisions. And so, but in thinking about the one thing that My Voice, the My Voice tool does have is the storytelling piece, it's this personal voices. We have over 200 youth just in the county alone, and we have 1,800 youth nationwide. So we have a good solid group of kids who are responding regularly to these particular issues. So in thinking about this and how to design the data, I focused in on specifically leveraging youth voices, so the, the text messages that we have, to create decision-making aids that are informational, informational and actionable. So I worked with the My Voice team um, to create a new question set, essentially getting at what is the current status of mental health care and youth's lives? Are they aware of it? Are they, do they know, have any knowledge about it? What are their priorities and barriers? And I'd like to share with you a couple of the quotes um, that we got back. <clears throat> so in sifting through a lot of these text messages, what rose to the top for me was around social stigma. It's the root of everything that's happening with this and youth not being able to have healthy or viable relationships, not being able to reach out for services because they're internalizing stigma themselves. Um, it really prevents them from getting out there and seeking the help that they need. So with this frame in mind, um, I jumped into 60 iterations of sketches, mind maps, diagrams, metaphors, all kinds of stuff, <laughs> um, trying to understand how do I weave these, this narrative together? How do I connect these youth voices? Because this was a new question set, um, it wasn't already analyzed, I had to spend a lot of time myself digging through the data and understanding what these themes are which actually ended up being very beneficial to me because I actually learned how are youth responding? How much information are they providing? Is there even a connection? Um, and so through that, throughout this process of 60 iterations, um, I checked in with a My Voice team. Similar to Katie, I had a co-design process. I really wanted this to be collaborative. Um, I wanted it to be useful for the My Voice team. I worked with locally, local um, 
policymakers here to get feedback from them. Is this helpful? Is this actionable? Is it working? And I would like to share with you sort of three main insights that rose to the top through this process to think about actually getting to that sort of informational and actual. So the first thing that came up, one of my quick sketches, is what we have in terms of the information is we have all these voices, all these text messages, and then we have these synthesized themes. So for the mental health context, the things that rose to the top were, um, let's see if I can remember them, awareness, which basically having a general health knowledge, um, understanding the warning signs, knowing what mental health care is. There was trust, so having trusted relationships in your life with peers and adults is critical to combining in your everyday needs. Then there was access to care if we need it. Care is available, it's accessible. And finally, um, acceptance. So this digs into that stigma a little bit that youth are stigmatizing themselves, youth are experiencing stigma, and we really need overall acceptance of mental health concerns to be able to move forward. So in thinking about how to piece this together, the first thing that rose to the top was depicting a model of major themes. So Showing the relationship between the themes in some type of visual way, in a visual model, it makes it easy and quick to digest. They can pick it up, they can read it, even if they don't read the whole one pager, they know, oh, there's four different things that are arising in youth's lives, I need to hit on these different things. The next was thinking about, for me, how do I visualize this, this stigma? There's four major sort of components or uh, components of mental health that I mentioned, but stigma sort of fractures in to these things and breaks up how youth are able to access care or to share their concerns. In doing this particular one, what rose to the top though was thinking about how to visualize the voices. And this idea of showing comparison of youth voices really landed. There's over 200 in county. I wasn't sure how many I should add or which ones were the right ones. And when I, what I did in this particular model is I juxtaposed two, um, two completely opposite experiences. So on the inside, it's a youth that's thriving. They're saying, I have parents in my life. I'm doing really well. Youth on the outside are not thriving. They're saying, I don't have anyone to talk to. My parents dismiss me. And so being able to see sort of a thriving kid and a not thriving kid invoked an incredible emotional response. They are drawn into the information and they wanted to know more. They wanted to know how many kids in my community are not thriving. Now that I know that there's these four different components, how do I sort of help them along in achieving those? And the last thing, um, as I moved sort of towards the higher level fidelity, was around the previous two were informational. Again, just sort of hitting at what's in the, in the information, not necessarily getting to actionable. Um, and then what rose to the top was some way to demonstrate consequences of inactions. So how do we make decisions? We weigh the pros and cons of a situation and we move forward. We evaluate what the trade-offs are and we make a choice. And so what was proposed to me is could there be questions? Could I scaffold the audience or walk the audience through this particular document to help them gain information to again getting to the final point in which they actually can make a decision? And can probing questions get at some of those nuances in the relationships to really help you see and help you make decisions? So my current prototype as it stands looks like this. Um, it's a lot right now. Still got to figure out how to edit down. It's something that I need to work on. But um, the first thing is depicting a model of themes. It's right there. It's on the first front page. There's model. They know what each of those different themes mean. There's a couple of quotes to support that information. Next is showing the comparison of youth experiences. So I have them opposite each other so they can see kids who experience stigma in this category, kids who experience stigma in that category, and I can start to think about what are the youth like in my community. And finally, consequences of an action. Probing questions to help them think about what the actual information. So to summarize, um, and thinking about how do we get at informational and actionable is essentially those three things that I just shared. And the last thing that I'm still working on is around giving evidence to map upstream and downstream policy interventions. So in the policy world, this is language that policy users think about. They're thinking about today and they're thinking about tomorrow. They're thinking about immediate changes, they're thinking about legislative changes. And so our goal as the My Voice team is not to say there's a mental health crisis, you need to do X. It's to say there's a mental health crisis, Here's what youth are thinking and saying about it. Here's a document that can help you think about, help you ask questions and bring your own knowledge of your own community to think about the right direction to take. And the last thing within this process that came up as we go back and think about how do we actually operationalize this is my voice was just running, the my voice team was running these one time um, question sets, sort of gathering all of this information. They've been doing it for a year now. 
but they weren't really digging deeper into what's actually happening. And that's where the root of the actual information is, is seeing the relationships, but knowing sort of what the nuance is in terms of mental health. What is stigma? What does stigma look like in the lives of youth? We need to ask more questions. So I proposed the team to running a second set as question, second question set as part of their process. So now that you have a baseline of understanding about the particular issue, you can move into this more deeper, nuanced stuff that policymakers are really eager to get to. So this is our next question set that we're going to ask uh, in a couple weeks, asking about stigma, asking about who stigmatizes you, how do youth, um, how do youth sort of decrease stigma, how can adults <coughs> decrease stigma, and what prevents youth from actually accessing services? Is it, if, it's, if it's stigma, is it that they don't want to go up to a branded office that says mental health care? Do they need private and safe spaces? And so hopefully through this process, we can get more tangible, actionable information. To conclude tonight, I'd just like to take you back to where I started and say that a lot of people have asked me in this process, how come youth are not part of your co-design process? Where are the youth voices? And for me, I think, when we, as I've mentioned, there are all these barriers, and specifically for youth, my voice is that tool that's breaking through those particular barriers. At the very beginning, youth are the forefront of what we do. We are gathering their information. We are gathering their experiences. And it's on us to figure out the best way to deliver this information. We always want youth to stay politically engaged, but what we hear from the My Voice youth or My Voicers is that they love this tool. They can do it anywhere they want. It fits into their lives. It's private. They don't feel intimidated by it. It's not confusing. It's really hitting on what civic engagement should be in terms of accessible for all. So with that said, I thank you, and I'll take questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Great presentation, very, very powerful, very, very passionate. Um, yeah, like I, I know I, I really think this is a very important issue, not not only in the realm that you are working in, but anywhere in the world, and especially um, as faculty members, we have to deal with this a lot. Um, and and a, as much as I, I empathize and care about this issue, I've also seen misuse of this. Uh, aspect like I, I'll get emails. Oh, I'm having a mental mental health issue. I'm going to go to class today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. like okay. Um, and so I'm not sure how do we. And I think it should be. It's like very difficult to manage because they are really trying to be sympathetic and try to build it into policy and um, sort of make it trickle down in every aspect of what we do at, at campus here. So how would you? suggest that that abuse of the system or misuse as bad it, it sounds right now mm -hmm. I'm just really I am really curious to know how would that be handled or built into all this sure um, so I've had a lot of uh, ethical dilemmas in this process John the program director is also my advisor we've had lots of conversations um, you know I think that's why my project became so important for the My Voice team, is that they need to follow through on their mission of actually delivering the information. And look, I'll stand here and say, I can't change corruption. I can't change tyranny. Um, and so I think it's really on us as a public to recognize that mental health is an important issue. We need to figure out how to address, address it. Those in positions of power need to be having these conversations. And so that is what ultimately this, this project is about, is delivering the right, relevant, lived experience for those who need to be addressing this issue. I could chat with you for hours about what we should do to bring down the government, but I don't think it's effective <laughs> use of our time. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. So it's a very grassroots effort. Um, Tammy, unfortunately, she couldn't be here tonight. She's in Thailand. You know, choices. Um, but um, she is an incredibly powerful individual, very passionate, and you know that's what really drew drew her to start this. Is that she kept having youth. She's a family practitioner. She kept having youth in her office saying, like, "Why are you doing it this way?" Or, 
I don't feel safe in here. Like, why don't anyone talk to me about how I want my services delivered? So she is out there all the time talking about this tool and people essentially like this would say, I want my kid to get involved. Can I figure out? And she's like, yep. And she just hands it all out. Um, she also did this past summer, she does what they call pop-up parties where specifically in the county here, they did a lot of on the ground efforts of going to farmers markets and community events and saying, hey, there's this My Voice tool, do you want to get involved? And it's just, it grew, it's a grassroots movement. Yes? I'm curious if, if you have, uh, I think what you've done spectacular, two Thank questions you. out of like that. Sure. One of them I understand that you won't tell me the answer, but what, what inspired you to work with youth? Yeah. And uh, the second question, are there opportunities in your design where you're bringing youth together physically? Yes, great question. Both great questions. Um, so I'll start with the, the second one first. Um, yeah, so I am very passionate, and I'm very passionate about this now. This is essentially my goal coming into the MDES program was to link policy and design, and I found a space in which I could do it and prove that it's a space that needs to be pursued. And so I'm going to be continuing to work um, with the My Voice team, and we're talking about doing charrettes and bringing policymakers and youth in the same room together, building off of the information. Charrettes, charrettes are workshops, essentially, design workshops. Um, so that's happening. And um, we don't want, my, you know, thinking about ethical implications, we don't want this tool to replace youth engagement directly. That's not the goal. It's to have a diversity of voices. And then we still need to support youth in being civically engaged and present and, and involved. Um, in terms of why, why youth, um, so it's really interesting. 10 years ago, I really um, started my career in AmeriCorps. Um, and I will say uh, civic engagement has always been a core value of mine. Um, my mom is here tonight and we were talking about my grandfather who was very much a community organizer. My mother is very much a community organizer even though she won't admit it. Um, and so I was raised in being civically engaged. It's what you do. Um, and I have a deep, deep uh, love for democracy. And so when I did AmeriCorps, I was working with youth in a, a lower resourced community and um, I had all these amazing kids who would come in day after day and you never knew what, they're, what they were gonna be like and it's because their life was so chaotic. You know, like I would come in and they would say, so and so just got shot around the corner. Um, you know, I would come in and would, you know, they'd have new buttons on their bag of the cousin that they lost. Um, and I had this one particular youth um, who was amazing, and um, he often was involved in the juvenile detention center, and you could tell that the system was working against him. And it, that experience for me recognized my own privilege, my own place, my own personal struggles, and I do also struggle with mental health, and so there's a very personal, deep connection to this project. Um, but it, I just, you know, I have to do it. There's no other choice. Can't not do it. No. No, it's okay. It's fine. I think it's, I think it's um, two things. I think there is a level of trust with um, the My Voice team. I think also there are plenty of My Voicers who just want text. They don't want to be involved. And what's so great about this is they can be involved in a way that makes sense for them, that, feel, that they feel comfortable with. Um, in terms of youth who want to be engaged, I don't think there's a lack of youth that want to be engaged, to be perfectly honest. There's just barriers to their level of engagement. And so by creating the space for them, they will jump up and voice their concern. And so for me, um, it's working with community, it would be working with community partners here in, the, here in the community who work with youth to say, hey, we're doing this type of charrette. I mean, there's been tons of work in Ypsilanti, which um, um, youth who are doing on the ground efforts similar to my voice, who are also struggling with how to deliver this information. And so it's really just connecting the dots. I mean, that's what, that's what this work is, is just getting people together, bridging communication.
fell down the job. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, survey is definitely in there. You may have missed it, though. Oh, yeah, it? yeah. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't catch it, but to me, that, that's one of the more, I understand you're passionate about this particular area of those views, but I think mm -hmm. one of the more powerful things of this tool is that it is um, another way to access information. It could be information about lots of different things. Sure. And then finding a way to take that information and arrange it in such a manner, visualize it or whatever it would be, so that it could be um, actionable. Yeah, they do. They do a great job, and it's you know the university has amazing people, um, and they have a great team of practitioners who work together. Um, but I think it's really what is most interesting for me about this is just coming from my previous experience, like moving away from just presenting information. It's not enough to just present information. You need structures to help people, help those in power make decisions because they're just going to say, "Tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. Tell me what to do." We can't tell you what to do. I mean, we'll give you ideas that may have worked somewhere else, but not here. We can give you information to inform how you make your decisions, and that's what we can do. Thank you.